So I arrived at VIMS about a year ago to combine my interests in both Fish and Chesapeake Bay. And today I'll be sharing with you um, some different methods that our lab group uses to sample and study fishes, um, a different overview of diversity of fishes that can be found in the bay in our sampling programs, and talk a little bit about some of the challenges facing fishes and their habitats in the bay. So the Chesapeake Bay, which is right here in our back, the largest estuary in North America and the third largest in the world, a significant portion of the region drains into the bay, as you can see here. The headwaters of the Susquehanna River are all the way up in Cooperstown, New York. So within the Chesapeake Bay, the land to water ratio is 14 to 1, which is the largest of any coastal water body in the world. But surprising to a lot of people, the average depth of the bay is only about 21 feet, which is relatively shallow. So that lends itself to being a very productive ecosystem. So the bay is not only home to over 18 million people, but it can also be home to almost 350 different species of fish. So to study these fishes, VIMS conducts several different long-term surveys that play an important role in researching and monitoring the bay's fish populations. So these surveys help track trends in seasonal distribution and the abundance of fishes that have ecological importance, but also those targeted by commercial and recreational fisheries. So these three surveys that I'm going to talk about today are the Juvenile Fish Trawl Survey, the Juvenile Striped Bass Seine Survey, and a survey on American eel recruitment. So these three surveys are conducted by the lab group that I'm a part of at VIMS, but today I'm just gonna focus on the top two, both these surveys take place in the Virginia portion of the bay, including the Rappahannock, York, and James Rivers. So starting off, the VIMS Juvenile Fish Trawl Survey is the oldest continuous monitoring program for marine and estuarine fishes in the United States. And it's been conducted every year since 1955. The main goal of this survey is to monitor the relative abundance of recreationally and commercially important fishes. So we collect data at um, 111 stations in that Virginia portion of the bay, taking a five minute tow with an otter trawl at each one. So this survey is conducted currently on the VIMS uh, RV tidewater since 2014. So if you're ever out on the water and you see the tidewater, it's possible that we're trawling for fish. The um, RV fish hawk on the right was used for this survey from 1990 through 2014. So this survey uses a gear that's known as an otter trawl to collect fish. So how an otter trawl works is the net is lowered by a winch into the water. And as the net extends behind the boat, there's two steel doors that help spread the opening wide and help the net stay open. The top of the net has a series of floats and the bottom is weighted. So as the net is pulled behind the boat, fish are collected in the cod end. Let's see if I can get this laser pointer working. That's this cod end right here um, that has a finer mesh and after the five minute tow the net is hauled back up on the deck and the fish are removed. They're sorted by species, they're measured and processed. The second major survey that's conducted by our group each year is the striped bass seine survey. So this survey generates the second longest continuous striped bass index in the United States, and it's been running continuously since 1980. So this index is part of a coastwide sampling of striped bass from New England all the way down to North Carolina. That's under the coordination of the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. Striped bass, as you might be aware, are one of the top predators in the Bay's marine food webs, but um, they're also better known as supporting lucrative fisheries, both recreational and commercial. So the goal of this survey is to monitor juvenile striped bass in their summer nursery grounds. So these are the fish that just hatched in the spring. And since striped bass spawn in freshwater tributaries, this survey is conducted mainly in those three Virginia rivers, so the Rappahannock, York, and the James. As, as in the name, this survey uses a gear called a beach seine. So we use a hundred foot Foot, four foot long deep stain that has a wooden braille handle at each end. So at each station, collections are made by having one end of the net remaining on shore and the other end is taken perpendicular to the shoreline off into the water and you pull it offshore, down current, back to the shore, resulting in sweeping 
a, um, a semicircle quadrant. So this is conducted from the shore. So what are these data used for? Each of these surveys has different target species. So we catch fish, we identify and measure them, and we assess the environmental conditions at the time of catch. All of these surveys, again, is to develop those indices of abundance, like these graphs on the left. So these measure the relative size of each year class. It lets researchers and fishery managers help predict the future abundance of stock so they can manage these species. So what do we catch? In this trawl survey, we encounter about um, 120 unique species each year. Here you can see a top 10 list for 2019, so it might surprise you what species are some of the most abundant in the bay. So we're going to take a closer look now at each of these species and many more. So every time we lower a net into the water and collect a sample, sometimes we catch several different species. Sometimes we only catch one species. And sometimes we might catch various sizes of a single species at the same time. So these are several different um, individual weak fish of different life stages. So you can see we have um, some very small juveniles and then closer to an adult weak fish. We also might find several species of one family of fishes at the same time. So these are all family um, examples of the family cyanidae or the drums. So you can see that they all look pretty similar unless you know what to look for. So speaking of drums, I thought this would be a good place to start. This is probably my favorite family of fishes if I had to pick one just because they're all so diverse and unique. So these four species, the Atlantic croaker, spot, silver perch, and weak fish are all within those top 10 caught in our trawl survey. They're all frequently found um, in brackish waters, so more downriver in higher salinity areas, but they can occasionally be found in more temperate or fresh waters. Drums are usually small to medium-sized um, bottom-dwelling fishes. They feed on invertebrates and occasionally other fishes as they get larger. And the name drums comes from the really unique vocalizations they make. So a croaker, it's right in the name there, but they, um, they move these strong abdominal muscles that are attached to their air bladder, which acts as a resonating chamber. So it amplifies those croaking or drumming sounds. Here are some more examples of drums. You have your spotted sea trout, your red drum, black drum, and northern kingfish. So some of these might be familiar if you're a fisherman, a fisherwoman. So the red drum has that characteristic um, tail spot um, back by its tail. Sometimes you'll find some up on its dorsal surface. And a couple other unique characteristics um, of some of these fish, including the black drum and the northern kingfish, are these chin barbels that they have, which help them sense prey. So moving on from drums, talking a little bit about striped bass and white perch. So striped bass are the state saltwater fish of Virginia. It's also the focus of my current research at VIMS, so they have a special place in my heart. Striped bass are also known as rockfish or striper. It's a large predatory fish with those characteristic dark horizontal stripes. They live in various habitats throughout the bay and their tributaries um, over the course of their life. If they move up, upstream in spring to spawn in freshwater, they can spend summer and winter in deeper channels. Uh, white perch is a very close relative of striped bass and it's one of the most frequently caught fish in our trawl survey. They are a smaller silvery fish with a highly domed back. So white perch live in fresh and brackish waters throughout the Chesapeake Bay and its tidal tributaries, and they're common to almost every river. And a similar shape um, to like a striped bass would be something like a bluefish. So bluefish um, can get pretty large. They're a longer fish with a greenish blue body and a forked tail, and they visit the bay's open waters from spring through autumn. Another group of fishes that's commonly found in the bay and collected in our trawl are flatfishes. So flatfishes conceal themselves from predators by burying in bottom sediments and changing colors to blend in with their surroundings. So here I'd like to highlight the uh, hog choker, which is up in this top right corner. So you might remember this is one of the most abundant fishes in Chesapeake Bay, which um, I know to me, I always find surprising because um, you don't look at that and think that it would be really common. But their unusual name comes from when farmers would 
feed this fish to their hogs. And if you've ever held one or felt a hog choker, they have um, really sandpaper like scales. So the hogs would have a hard time eating them. So while this might be one of the most abundant fishes in the bay, another one that most people are more familiar with is the summer flounder up here in the upper left corner. So the summer flounder visits the middle and lower Chesapeake Bay from spring through autumn. They can grow 15 to 22 inches in length, females usually larger than the males. And they're brownish on top and whiter on the bottom um, with various large spots on their top side of their body. And they have a long dorsal fin that stretches from the head all the way down to its slightly pointed tail. And as we know, with most flatfishes, both eyes are located on the top side of their head. So speaking of having eyes on one side of your head, among flatfishes, there are left-eyed and right-eyed flatfishes. So a lot of people might not realize, but the larval stages of these species initially look like any other fish with an eye on each side. And as the fish develops, one eye will migrate around to either the left or right side. So depending on what side of the body the eyes are found, it's a good way for people to identify what species you have. So the summer flounder on the left here is considered to be a left-handed flatfish because its mouth and eyes are on the left side of the body when it's viewed from above versus a winter flounder has their eyes and mouth on the right side of their body. Sometimes flounder can be pretty prevalent in our catch and this is a great image here that you can see their darker dorsal surface and their white underbelly. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about catfishes. There are three different species of catfish that we catch in our trawl. So we have the blue catfish, channel catfish, and the white catfish. The blue catfish in particular are considered an inv in invasive species in the bay and they were introduced back in the 1970s. So there are growing numbers and the rapid expansion throughout the region has raised some concerns about the potential impact that they might have on these other native species. The blue catfish are really generalistic, opportunistic feeders, which means they'll eat pretty much anything. They're long-lived and they can become very large. So they have become a popular recreational fish, so there's this ongoing discussion on the best practices to support this fishery, but also control the population to protect other species. So just as an example of how widespread blue catfish can be, some trawls on the upper stretches of our Virginia rivers um, can pull up hundreds of blue cats in a single tow and they're not very fun to get out of the net. All those spines get stuck. <laughs> so while we're up in the fresher stretches of the rivers, um, let's take a look at some of the many important forage fishes that we catch. So forage is another term that we sometimes use for prey or bait fish. They are an important component of healthy ecosystems by providing food for larger birds, fish, and uh, marine mammals. And they can link our planktonic communities with those larger links in the food chain. So here you can see that many of these are smaller silvery fishes and we often can catch very similar looking species together. So all of these species are in the family Clupeidae, which includes herrings. So herrings are an important group in the tributaries of the bay. They migrate into freshwater to spawn in the spring. So many are silvery, thin-bodied fishes. They school, um, the schools feed in midwater or near the surface on zooplankton, small crustaceans, small fish, or fish eggs. So you have, as some examples here, you have the American shad, American thread herring. It has this um, long extension of its dorsal fin. Um, the hickory shad and the gizzard shad, which I always like to identify with their um, bright yellow eyes. Um, then in the middle here, you have your blueback herring and your alewife. So the river herring fishery, which includes um, those two fish in the middle, the blueback and the alewife, um, has been one of the most valuable fisheries in the bay, with annual catches once exceeding 8 million pounds in Maryland and 30 million pounds in Virginia. Um, unfortunately, the degradation and destruction of their spawning habitat and the restriction of their migration routes by dams have contributed to the decline of these stocks. So one important filter feeding herring of note that I wanted to touch on is the Atlantic menhaden. So menhaden are a key prey item for many important fishes, including bluefish, weakfish, striped bass, um, sharks, mackerels, as well as many seabirds and mammals. Um, they're also well known for supporting an important historical fishery in the Bay Region. 
they're a very oily fish. So although some people use it as bait, a lot of the menhaden caught in the bay are processed for fish oil and for livestock feed. Another group of common freshwater and brackish forage fishes are the killifishes. They live in tidal creeks and sand flats. They have a streamlined head and body and they're very hardy. I also think they're very beautiful and charismatic. I worked on these top two species for my master's degree. So the striped killifish and the mummy chog. Um, we we'll also have the banded killifish and the sheep's head minnow. But an interesting thing to note about the striped killifish up in this top left corner is they exhibit what we call sexual dimorphism. Basically, the males and females look different. So the fish on top with the horizontal stripes is a female and the vertical stripes fish on the bottom is a male. So wrapping up our big forage fishes groups, two more of the top 10 most frequently caught fishes in the trawl survey are the anchovies. So the bay anchovy and the striped anchovy. In fact, the bay anchovy is the number one most abundant fish in the bay, so it's a little crown. But both of these species are small translucent fish that live in schools throughout the Chesapeake Bay. The striped anchovy also has this um, really charismatic, thick um, silver stripe. And both of these species feed mostly on zooplankton, primarily copepods, and if you've ever caught them and opened their mouths, they have a very um, large, wide mouth. So again, just to show you how prevalent these bay anchovies can be, um, they are the most abundant fish species in the bay and the most um, abundant that we catch in our surveys. So on average, more than 50 million juvenile bay anchovies are produced in the bay each year and adult bay anchovies produce more than 100 trillion eggs per year. So now that we've seen the more common fish that we catch, let's take a look at some other more unique species that we do still see from time to time, starting with um, the American eel and sea lamprey. So eels, um, seen there on the left, spend most of its life in fresh and brackish tributaries, including streams, creeks, rivers, lakes, and ponds. So some may live in the bay's shallow waters. So eels are usually active at night and during the day they will hide under a rock or bury themselves in bottom sediments. So eels have a um, unique life cycle. It's a term that we call catadromous and what this means is that they live in freshwater rivers um, and then spawn in the ocean. So they are migratory fishes. During the fall, mature eels will swim out of Chesapeake Bay to the Sargasso Sea, which is an area of the Atlantic Ocean east of the Bahamas. They will spawn and then die. Then after about a year, the larvae transform into this stage that we call glass eels. So that's what is in this, um, this image on the top left that this hand is holding are some glass eels. And these glass eels are carried by currents back to the mouth of the bay to begin their migration up to the bay's tributaries to freshwater where they will undergo several more um, developmental stages as they grow into adults. So sea lampreys um, are parasitic and they are also migratory fishes, but they do their life cycle in the opposite direction. They are what we call anadromous, so more like a striped bass or a salmon that will spend its adult life in ocean waters and then come into fresh water to spawn. The long-nosed gar is a very primitive fish with a long spotted body and a slender beak-like snout. Um, they have really hard armor-like scales. These are very old fishes. They live in quiet, fresh, and brackish water tributaries throughout the watershed. I think they're very cool. Sturgeons are another example of a prehistoric fish that have existed for more than 120 million years. So these fishes were around during the Cretaceous period when dinosaurs roamed the earth and they haven't changed much in the way that they look. So like gar, they have really thick armor-like scales and they're covered in hard um, bony plates. You can see some along the top here that are called scoots. So sturgeon are known by most as the source of caviar. Um, Atlantic sturgeon visit the Chesapeake Bay in spring to spawn in the James and York rivers right here in Virginia. Um, it was once found throughout the bay and its freshwater rivers, but sturgeons unfortunately are very sensitive to poor water conditions. So this combined with their slow rate of maturity, um, damming of their spawning rivers and a history of 
fishing for them for that caviar has caused the species to become pretty rare and they've actually been classified as endangered since 2012. So the bottom of Chesapeake Bay is not just one giant sand or mud flat. There's a lot of structure. So there's oyster reefs, your rocky outcroppings, there's other debris like wrecks or pilings, you have your buoys and jetties, and many fishes like to inhabit these structures or to feed off of the invertebrates that grow on them. So we have a lot of fishes that we call structure associated fishes. And some examples of, we, of these that we find are uh, the oyster toadfish, um, they have a really characteristic look to them, a big, wide, strong mouth. You have your Atlantic spade fish and your striped blenny, which is a, a smaller bottom dwelling fish. Another fish that's found in rocky areas around structures is the black sea bass. So black sea bass are popular with recreational anglers. They can average 12 inches in length, but can get as long as two feet in length. Usually they're solitary bottom dwellers. The juveniles live in deeper vegetated areas and the lower bay is an important nursery and feeding area for young black sea bass. So now we're gonna get into some of the really weird looking guys. So uh, sea robins found um, up here in this top left corner are bottom dwelling. They can be found on sandy bottoms of estuaries in the near shore environment and they have these distinct um, almost wing-like pectoral fins and the lower rays of these fins you can kind of see them on either side of the head here um, are modified to look almost like fingers and they help the fish um, look like they're walking along the bottom searching for food so really unique looking. Um, below the sea robin is the three-spine stickleback. So this fish is native to most inland coastal waters worldwide, um, and it's most well known for long being the subject of scientific study for many different reasons. So these fish are very tolerant of environmental changes. They have many different body types and they exhibit some unique behaviors. So um, it's one of the more common fish that can be found in, in science laboratories. Spotted hake up here on the top right is another important forage fish that's common to the bay year round. It's a member of the cod family, so it's related to those fish that might be in your fish and chips. It's also a bottom dwelling fish. Uh, finally, on this bottom right panel here is a fish called the northern stargazer. So it's really strange looking. Um, they have a speckled flattened body and a large head. They live at the bottom of the lower Chesapeake Bay's deeper open waters. And northern stargazers have an organ on their heads that can deliver an electric charge that stuns and confuses their prey and helps ward off predators. And they can be called scarred stargazers because their eyes are on the top of their head and it looks like they're, they're looking up all the time. So one of my all-time favorite fishes is the northern puffer. So puffers hang out near the bottom. They have beak-like mouths to crush the shells of small mollusks and crustaceans. So on the um, top right here, you can see the typical form of the fish as it's swimming. But as we know, when threatened or disturbed, they can puff up um, by inhaling air or water into a special chamber that's near their stomach. And although some types of puffer fish are poisonous, the northern puffer is not. Often confused for pufferfish, um, the striped furfish is a spiny, mostly solitary bottom dweller that's found in areas near underwater grass beds near the middle and lower bay. Sometimes people are surprised that we have more exotic looking fish species in the bay. One of these is the look down. It's a silvery compressed fish that visits the middle lower bay. And most often these are found in sandy areas near bridges and pilings, and they usually live in small schools close to the bottom. Another fish that people might be surprised to see that we have in the bay is the spot fin butterfly fish. Um, it's found in all tropical and subtropical waters and is the only species of butterfly fish that's recorded in Chesapeake Bay. So usually these guys are found in coral reefs down near Florida or um, the Caribbean, but juveniles might be carried northward by the Gulf Stream. We can even find seahorses in the bay. Um, the line seahorse lives among bay grasses in the 
shallow waters of the middle and lower Chesapeake Bay. We also catch sharks and rays in the bay. So unlike the species we've seen, um, sharks and rays are cartilaginous, which means their skeletons are made of cartilage rather than bone. The sandbar shark here is the most common shark found in the Chesapeake Bay and along the mid-Atlantic coast. So in fact, the Chesapeake Bay is one of the most important sandbar shark nursery areas on the East Coast. Adults can reach around seven feet in length. They are found in coastal waters, preferring smoother sandy bottoms, but they're seldom seen at the water surface and they almost never move into fresh water. The spiny dogfish is a small abundant shark that visits the bay from late fall to early spring. This shark is named in part for these um, spines that are located on its dorsal side near its dorsal fin. Um, the blunt-nosed stingray is a common stingray that's found along the Western Atlantic. It has a whip-like tail and it varies in sandy or muddy sediments. And like other stingrays, it does have a um, spine back here near its tail. So you wanna be very careful when encountering these fish um, out when you're at the beach. Butterfly rays are pretty easy to identify thanks to their really long wing-like fins. So they're shaped more like a football um, than they are like a flat frisbee like other stingrays might be. But they also have a very short tail, um, but they do still have a spine. So you have to be a little careful with these guys. Another ray that we see in the bay is the bullnose ray. This is in the eagle ray family. It has a distinguished head and triangle-like fins. And last but not least, uh, the clear nose skate. So skates are different from stingrays. They have a fleshier tail, which you can see here. You can see these little um, tail fins on, on this tail right here. Um, and they don't have a spine um, like other stingrays. So Clear nose skates are easily identified by these translucent patches on either side of their snouts. You can see in this left hand image and their uh, mottled dorsal surface. So these guys are found along the Atlantic and Gulf Coast of the United States in shallow waters of the continental shelf. So now that we've seen some examples of the wide diversity of fishes that live in the bay and learned how we monitor their abundance through our different surveys, I um, wanted to talk a little bit about some of the challenges that are facing fishes and their habitats within Chesapeake Bay. So Chesapeake Bay is an important nursery habitat for many fishes and you might have heard me use that term already. So a nursery area is a highly productive region where fishes spawn, where the eggs hatch, and where juvenile fish spend the first few months or years of their life. The bay is such a highly productive habitat that even for species that are found along the entire Atlantic coast, like summer flounder or striped bass, the bay provides really important habitats for these fish to spawn and for their young to grow into adults. So nursery habitats support the survival and growth of young fishes. These habitats are really important because they help protect and increase the chances that fish will grow up to become part of that fishable population. So this annual production or how many fish are produced in a given year is a term that we call recruitment in fishery science. So this recruitment is a measure of how many of those juveniles are going to grow up to become, <coughs> excuse me, adults. So fishes that use estuaries comprise 46% by weight and 68% by value of the commercial fish and shellfish landed nationwide. So why should we care about nursery areas? The bay provides spawning and nursery sites for several important species of fish. Um, those with more unique life cycles, those anadromous and catadromous migratory fishes like striped bass, shads, American eels, um, other shelf spawner fishes like flounders and drums, the juveniles come into the shallow waters of the bay to feed and grow. After hatching, the juvenile fish utilize um, shallow water estuaries where they undergo a period of rapid growth and development during this first year of life. Um, but what makes a 
good ha nursery habitat um, a good one is the functions that it provides. So um, optimal environmental conditions like temperature and oxygen, juvenile fish of different species are susceptible to higher temperatures or low oxygen conditions, or um, if there's more precipitation than normal, that's gonna change how salty the water is, that might also impact juvenile fish. Um, a good habitat also needs to provide ample food resources. So for juvenile fish, this usually includes zooplankton or small invertebrates. And these habitats also need to provide them refuge from predators. So whether that's larger fish or birds, they need to have somewhere where they can hide and just focus on eating and growing. Many different factors can impact habitat conditions. So fish habitat is strongly influenced by natural and human factors. On the natural side of things, annual and seasonal environmental fluctuations can lead to changes in fish distributions and affect the availability of those really good habitats. So again, temperature, precipitation or salinity or um, oxygen levels can all impact these habitat conditions. And in deeper waters, you might even see a phenomenon that we call habitat squeeze. So if you have higher surface temperatures and lower oxygen levels near the bottom, it can really compress the area that's a good habitat for those less tolerant fish. But more importantly, when you have multiple stressors present at the same time, so warmer waters with low oxygen, um, fish are even more vulnerable to disease and mortality. Some other threats to this continued productivity out of these nursery habitats, um, habitat alterations. So urbanization and shoreline development can lead to habitat loss by reducing or removing critical habitats like underwater seagrasses. And it can also lead to a reduction in water quality through sedimentation, erosion, and runoff from both agricultural areas and impervious surfaces in urban areas. Um, toxic contaminants like harmful algal blooms and hypoxia can further reduce water quality and habitat health. You also have to contend with invasive species. So species like blue catfish, um, potentially can have a much wider range and it can impact the abundance of native species either from um, predating on them directly or from occupying that space that would otherwise go to those native species. So with that, um, I just wanted to thank you very much for your time today. I hope you enjoyed seeing some fish pictures and learning about some of the fish that you might see out in the bay when you're fishing or at the beach. Um, and I'll just close here by saying that if you're interested in other events that VIMS holds, you can subscribe to eTidings, which is VIMS monthly e-newsletter to stay in the know about our upcoming public events and latest research. So you can text VIMS to that number on your screen now if you're interested in that. And just to put a little plug in for our next event coming up this Thursday, July 30th at seven o'clock PM is a webinar on climate change and sea level rise. So this like um, all VIMS events is free to attend, but registration is required to get access to the webinar. So if you're interested, you can go to this website here on the bottom, vims.edu slash events to sign up and find out more information. So with that, um, thanks again, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, so are all the fish that you have mentioned edible? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I, I would not say they were all edible. Um, some of them, although, you know, it depends on what you <laughs> consider edible, but a lot of these fishes, um, like a, like a croaker or a drum, um, like a bluefish, striped bass, those are edible, um, but others have a lot of spines and um, some harder scales that might be really difficult to fillet and they just might not be very tasty. So I would not say that they're all edible, but, but many of them could be. Why were blue catfish introduced to the bay? So how did they, how did they, come, to, how did they come to be in our area? Um, why is a, is a good question. Um, I'm not sure that I know the exact reason for that, but um, oftentimes 
many species are introduced um, as another food option. So we know catfish in other regions of the country um, in the Midwest or down south are popular food items. Um, they're fun to fish for. So oftentimes that's why fish get introduced in other areas for those same reasons. But um, we don't always know how a species will respond in a different habitat and sometimes um, they in, adapt really well, like in the case of blue catfish. So they've been able to um, really have a population boom and uh, have some unanticipated consequences on, on other species. So I actually have a question. Um, we were at the beach a couple weeks ago and um, we encountered something that we weren't quite sure whether it was a skate or a ray. Um, no matter how much we looked it up afterwards. So is there an easy way to identify the difference between a skate and a ray? Because one's going to sting you and the other one's not. Yeah, sometimes um, the stingers on stingrays can get broken off. Um, they do grow back. So sometimes if the spine has been broken, it can be a little harder to identify. So skates as a rule are going to have a, a thicker, fleshier tail and usually they have a more um, spiny surface whereas the rays are gonna be smoother and they'll have a skinnier whip-like tail. Those are the biggest characteristics that are usually different. Yeah, unfortunately they were swimming, so we didn't get a really good look at mm -hmm. them. Yeah, yeah, that makes it tougher then. Um, let's see, so next question is, what threats are there currently to the bay? And you went over this a little bit, but do you wanna elaborate? Yeah, so um, there's a lot of of threats just from our, our changing environment. And these aren't necessarily threats in the sense that they're negative. It's just that um, some species are slower or faster at adapting to these changes. So from an environmental standpoint, um, things like temperature and precipitation change on an annual basis, um, as well as a seasonal basis. But then we also have to contend with climate change. So um, yeah, just some fish are, are less suited to contending with, with warmer temperatures or if you have um, more frequent algal blooms and hypoxia, which is a, a low oxygen event, these can all threaten fish um, and the habitats that they occupy. And from a, a human standpoint, um, you know, if we have more pollution or runoff of nutrients and sediment um, into our bay waters, these will sometimes exacerbate those, those natural fluctuations that fish are experiencing. So it's, a, it's an ongoing balance that we have to meet. You mentioned a few fishes that hold a special place in your heart, but do you have an absolute favorite? Oh, <laughs> thanks Ashley for that question. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm really fortunate that I get to work with these estuarine fishes because these have always been my favorite, even more so than some of the, um, the coral reef fishes that you might see. But I think if I had to pick one single favorite, it would probably be the northern pufferfish. They're just too cute. Are there any plans to attempt to reduce blue cat population and their impact on the native species? Yeah, this is a, an ongoing conversation between scientists um, and managers. And um, as I mentioned briefly, sometimes there's different interests between trying to support the recreational fishery for these, these big blue cats um, and trying to control the population um, and mitigate their impacts on other species. So I know that one strategy that's been floated um, is trying to encourage a market for these fish. So to fish for them, so you can eat them, buy them in the soup markets. I've never um, seen them in soup markets myself and I haven't tried them, so I can't comment on, on the taste. But I know that's one strategy that, um, that has been put forward and discussions are, are ongoing on how to address blue cats. <laughs> oh, we've got somebody says blue cats taste great. Somebody has tried them. Good to know. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you guys for spending your, um, your summer afternoon with us in this heat. The sort of way to cool down and learn about fish. And thank you very much, Rachel, for uh, being available and being able to
um, spend your afternoon with us. I know we've been talking about this uh, this program for a while, and you were very willing to make the switch from in person to uh, to virtual. So we definitely appreciate that. No problem. Thanks very much for having me, and uh, happy fishing. Yep. Thanks everybody for spending the afternoon with us, and enjoy the rest of your day.